Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Harriet. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Carl Gables group, which is uh, within the city limits of Miami, Florida. Carl Gables officials would shudder if they heard me say that. <laughs> I forget that I'm in the state of Florida still. You know, I, I think I'm uh, way away here in Daytona Beach. It's such a far cry from Miami. I want to thank Fred for calling and inviting me on behalf of the committee. Um, I was delighted to accept, and I also want to thank uh, Shirley and Harold, who tell me they're the ones who recommended me. I'm so delighted to see so many of my friends from different parts of the state, Jacksonville, Naples, Tampa, and a lot of little these towns that I'm not sure where they are. And um, some of you have heard me speak over at St. Simon's and around, and I'm so glad to see you back. Thank you. Thank you for my sobriety. I like to tell my sobriety date. Uh, I'm, my last drink was on January the 14th, 1956, which is 38 years and some months ago. And I like to tell that for several reasons. Uh, first of all, I hope that I'm giving some uh, hope to you younger people. Uh, that there is such a thing as permanent sobriety. I think, you know, <laughs> you heard Liz this morning with uh, 43 at, for him. Hmm? 41 in 10 months. 41 in 10 months. <laughs> we all still lie. We still lie. <laughs> Stretch the truth. Uh, the Arkansas Traveler, 40-some uh, years. Eddie's here. God, how many, Eddie? 45 and three quarters. 45. <laughs> and, we, you know, you young people that are here, <laughs> she told her age this morning, 73. The Arkansas Traveler, what did he say, 81. And I'm 77. You know, there's hope for you. But I have to assure all of you who are young and think you're never going to be this old, I was that young once. And I've been where you are and where you've been. I've been there. And so has Liz. And so have Patsy and Eddie. And all these people with lots of sobriety have all been young once. And we all had to take our first drink somewhere along the line. And I'm going to tell you about that. The other reason I like to tell my sobriety date is not too long ago at a meeting that I walked into uh, in my area. Uh, and it looked like it was going to be a very fine meeting. And uh, about 8.29, the speaker seeker found out that her speakers hadn't arrived. And there had been some new people, visitors, coming in, and very attractive people shaking hands and introducing themselves. And she said, perhaps these visitors would like to share with us. And so they did. And the gentleman in particular was very sharing and told us and kept us very entertained for 35 minutes. And when the chips were given out, he took a white one. <laughs> So, you know, anybody can tell a great entertaining story when they've been sober 24 hours. <laughs> so I think it's important that you know that your speakers today have had a lot of sobriety and a lot of experience and strength and hope to share with you. Uh, your evening speaker tonight is not quite as old as we are, but he's <laughs> lived a hundred lives. <laughs> and uh, you will enjoy Sandy tonight. Uh, I'm told his plane just got in, so he's on his way here. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania originally. I was uh, born in a town called Kingston, Pennsylvania, near Wilkes-Barre, Scranton area, and I'm an only child. 
And um, my parents loved me very much, and I loved them very much, and uh, they spoiled me, and particularly my father. I was daddy's little girl. Anything I wanted, I went to daddy. And I had my own car when I had, was 15 years old and didn't have a driver's license for another year. He was a businessman who was very active in the community, belonged to many of the clubs, and um, they all knew that I was underage, but they looked the other way because I was Al Park's daughter. And my mother was a club woman, and she belonged to uh, the women's organizations and the DAR and a few things like that. And I grew up in a very lovely um, atmosphere. I went to the best of schools. Uh, my parents were um, a little different there. My father had very little formal education. And uh, my mother had gone away to college in the days when few women did that. My mother was one who not only drove her own car, but owned the first car a woman ever owned in that part of the country. So they were advanced in all their thinking and um, wished that I had been. But um, everything was very lovely, and I was sent not only to good schools, to uh, scholastically, and uh, to also to dancing school to learn my social graces, uh, to wear the white gloves and the black patent leather shoes and to stand up when my elders came into the room and to curtsy when a little boy would ask me to dance. And um, all those nice little things, the pretty dresses and uh, the perfume behind your ears, which I just did a few minutes ago. <laughs> and um, uh, I learned to be a little lady. And um, it was a happy childhood. I believed in Santa Claus for a long time. My mother was ashamed of me. I was so old and walking around, and I'd say, oh, Santa Claus is coming to our house, and I believed it. I really think I saw him one time. I really do. I'm still a little doubtful. <laughs> and the Easter Bunny, I knew about the Easter Bunny. We'd go up in the springtime, usually around Easter time, to check on the cottage to see how it had weathered the winter. And all of a sudden, I would find a, a beautiful colored egg. And I would pick it up and run to my daddy and say, Oh, the Easter Bunny has been here. And pretty soon, I'd find another and another and another. And it wasn't until I was a grown-up girl that I found out that there were only six, and Daddy had been hiding them over as fast as I found them. <laughs> but I want to tell you, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's how I came to you. When you told me that I could stay sober and that you had been sober for six months, I said, if you can stay sober for six months, I can too. I met Eddie not too long after I came to this program. I've known him all of my 38 years of sobriety, it seems. And they told me that they had been sober these many years, and I'd say, if you can do it, I can do it. And I believed in that just as I believed in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, and thank God I never had to drink again once I came to this program. And if any message today that comes from me, the message is that nobody in this room ever has to drink again. Some of you will, and some of you will die of alcoholism. But you don't have to. You're here where there's a life-giving program to help you to lead not only a comfortable life, but you'll be physically better. Did you hear Liz this morning? How. I broke my hip last year. I lay in January. I, I lay in bed and cried because I thought I would never walk again. I'm not jumping around like Liz is, but I'm walking and I'm walking good. I didn't even bring my cane with me. When I was about nine years old, my family loved. We were night people. My folks loved to play cards. They played a lot of bridge. And um, we lived a little ways out in the country from uh, the city. And um, when you live in the country from the city, that doesn't make much sense. But anyway. <laughs> and one night they were tired of playing bridge, and they said, let's go down to Ray Hoddle's for some lobster. And so about midnight we arrived in Ray Hoddle's and had steamed clams and lobster. And somebody pushed a little glass of brown stuff at me. And... Um, they had to take me because I couldn't leave me alone. And um, they pushed a little glass of brown stuff and said, drink this. It will help your indigestion. 
And I took a sip and, you know, it left a little white thing on my lip and it was bitter. It tasted funny. And I kind of made a face and then it started going down and it got down here and it turned around and came back up and said, oh, isn't that good? (laughs) I was grown up. I changed instantly. My lobster got easier to tackle and those clams, I just yanked them out and take two or three at a time. And all those other people, I was equal with the adults. I wasn't a nine-year-old kid. I felt good. And I really believe that from that moment on, I had the obsession for alcohol. The mental obsession that is one-third of our threefold disease. I I don't know that you could call it an obsession at nine years of age, but I sure began to think about that brown stuff and how it made me feel. And from then on, if there was a party, I wanted to know who was coming, and I listened to see if there was going to be some of that brown stuff. And if there was, I would get out in the kitchen and drain the glasses. And I always felt better. I felt different. And I, I, I didn't experience at that age the dis-ease, the dis-ease of our disease. I was a comfortable child. I was a happy child, a spoiled child, if you will. And there was nothing to be uncomfortable about. But I sure became uncomfortable after that because I wanted to renew that wonderful feeling I'd had. And I didn't get that opportunity really until I was age 15. I was 15 that summer and I got the uh, measles and I was going off to college in the fall. I had graduated high school early because I was a smart kid. I'd been taught at home and uh, went to school already knowing my letters and my numbers. In fact, I was too smart for the first grade, but not quite smart enough for the second grade. And so I spent half of my time in the first grade and half my time in the second. I really think that's affected my whole life because I've never felt comfortable with some groups of people. And yet sometimes I'm inferior to them and sometimes I'm superior. It was just like in the first and second grade. I wasn't quite smart enough for this group, but too smart for that group. And I think that's been the story of my life. But here in AA, I find out we're all about the same, sometimes equally smart and sometimes equally dumb. (laughs) And so when I was 15, I got the measles, and the doctor prescribed a little port wine. He said, it'll it'll help her get her strength back. Well, I want to tell you, a little port wine will do that, especially if you're an alcoholic, because they left me alone. My father didn't know what a little port wine was, and he brought the bottle. And, you know, he says, Mother and I are going next door. We're going to play some bridge with the Davenports. And he says, we'll be right next door if you need us. They came back a couple hours later. The bottle was mostly empty. I was sick. I had vomited. And came, when I came to, I said, wasn't that good? <laughs> and then the obsession started seriously. And I went off to college. And I went to college in the Depression days and Prohibition time. Some of you, I know, remember Prohibition. And those of you who don't, you missed it. You couldn't buy booze legally. You had to uh, find out ways and means of getting it, and most all of us did. But I went to college, and it was a Methodist college, and there were very few drinkers. But believe me, I found the ones who did. And I remember particularly, and I don't remember my junior or senior years, but both of them, perhaps, we'd go out at intermission time, and by golly, we'd get a, a bottle. And I don't know where we got it or how much it was, but it couldn't have been much. We didn't have much money. And certainly maybe a pint for four people. Always a couple in the front seat and a couple in the back seat. And you'd divide up this small bottle of booze. And as soon as the bottle was produced, I would get giddy and silly and begin to giggle. And when the top came off, I got excited. I was full-blown alcoholic. See, some of you believe that you drank too much too often and too long And you say you crossed over an invisible line and became an alcoholic. And with me, I was alcoholic from that very first drink at nine, that little glass of beer or ale or whatever it was. And from that time on, I was mentally obsessed, and now I became a compulsive drinker. And when we would have this stuff in between at intermission time, and we couldn't have more than a few slugs, as it were, it wasn't that much, But I was tipsy, and I would go back into the dance, and I would be dancing with Fred, and all of a sudden I would be dancing with John. And I would wonder at that time what happened. 
And it wasn't until years later when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and took my inventory, I'd been having blackouts when I was 18 years old, 19 years old. And I didn't know it. And then I graduated college, and I was 19, 20 years old, and went back up home. I went to college in Washington, D.C., and went back up to Pennsylvania, where I was introduced to a handsome fellow who was very old and very sophisticated. He was 25. You know, that's old when you're 19 or 20. And he'd been to one of the big colleges, Lehigh or Lafayette one. And... um, Oh, he was charming. I love to this. He's been dead 20 years, but I still love him to death. And he was a full-blown alcoholic at 25, and I was too, but I didn't know it. And neither did he, really. But um, I would be the one to drive everybody home about, for about three years. I was the one, the designated driver. And Harriet can hold her booze. I can remember them saying, Harriet's got a hollow leg. She'll drive us home. We'd be up in Scranton dancing at the Hotel Casey. They said, who's going to get us home? We're all drunk. No, no, Harriet's sober. She's all right. I would be drinking just as much, but there was that period that I could hold it. And then my tolerance changed, and I couldn't handle it at all. My father used to say at that time, I want you to meet my daughter. She can drink like a man. I don't know to this day what he meant. And I I think he meant it as a compliment until it got out of hand. Um, these are very, some of these things are they're symptoms of alcoholism, and you don't have to have them. But if you have, like I have, I would be careful because they were symptoms of my alcoholism. Um, I um, was supposed to have graduated to be a school teacher, and uh, you want to be very glad that I did not pursue that. <laughs> I would have made a terrible school teacher. Uh, instead, I, I got a job with the government. You know, that's where you can get away with most everything. <laughs> and eventually I began to, uh, I, I worked, uh, I, I was a good uh, secretary. I was a good worker. I was a good office manager and conscientious. But little by little, I was beginning to miss those Mondays. And uh, the Monday absenteeism, uh, slowly, slowly, not every Monday, but a couple of times a year, and then more Mondays than not. And eventually Monday and Tuesday. Then I had to get away early on Friday. And then um, it, it, I was transferred to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I lived in a, a, a private home. She rented out two or three rooms. And my room was lovely. It was in the front of the house with bay windows overlooking the front porch roof, the roof of the front porch. And it was cold up there in Philadelphia. And I would keep my beer on the windowsill. Now, I had kitchen privileges. I could have kept it in the refrigerator, but that was too far to go. When you're an alcoholic, you want it right there where you can see it. And um, the, the, um, we used to drink um, at the pubs on, after work, and, but on Saturdays and Sundays we'd go over to Camden, New Jersey, because in Pennsylvania you have blue laws, you did then. And you couldn't drink late on Saturday night, and you couldn't drink on Sunday. You couldn't buy it. And we, I, it, it had occurred to me that, you know, we were going over there too much, and I knew there was something wrong with my drinking. I'm not a stupid person. And um, I had already begun to try to eat the olive oil and coat my stomach with mashed potatoes and all the things that Liz was talking about this morning and um, uh, tr- trying not to get drunk. And the, the terrible part about alcoholism is that it's, uh, it's, never, it's not dependable. Sometimes the olive oil and the mashed potatoes would work, and I would not get too drunk. And so the next time I would do the same thing. I'd even, if I wore a red dress, and I st- if I didn't get too drunk, I'd wear the red dress again. <laughs> but if I was wearing the blue dress and I got drunk in the blue dress, the blue dress went out the window. I wouldn't wear that again because the blue dress got me drunk. So I did all those insane things that the book talks about. And, and so I knew there was something wrong with going over there to Camden all the time. And I thought, well, I, I need a hobby. And I went to the dime store and bought me a hobby. I bought a, a paint set. It paint by the numbers. God, what a mess that was. <laughs> and one evening, trying to stay away from booze but painting and reaching over for the beer, I knocked one out of the window. And, you know, I, there were five or six more, all big bottles, big bottles. And one rolled out down the roof. And poof, out I went. 
I was 20, 21 years old. I was thin. I was athletic. And I went down that roof, slip sliding through the slush. And I get down the drain pipe and I pick up that bottle of beer and I turn around and had to claw my way back up through the snow and the ice. And it occurred to me that this was not social drinking. <laughs> We were transferred down to Camp Lee, and this was the army I was working for. And we were transferred to Camp Lee in 1941 in Virginia, Petersburg, Virginia. And uh, it was there, I was there having a marvelous time. Uh, young officers, uh, clubs were open to all of us, and we were swimming in the different swimming pools we had, and all our uh, dances and parties were at the officers' clubs. And... Um, Pearl Harbor came along, December the 7th, 1941. And by this time, I was beginning to be absent again from work. And um, I remember going in on Monday, December the 8th, and absolutely oblivious to what was going on. We'd heard late in the afternoon, of course, that we were at war, that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And I went into work completely oblivious of what was going on in the world. And I said, what are you doing back? You were on Christmas vacation. And they'd look at me as if I were a complete zombie, which I really was. I was so self-centered. Self-centeredness, selfishness, we think, is the root of our problem. And I look back, when I go through my inventory, everything was self, self, self. Didn't care what all you people were doing as long as I was having a happy, happy time. Happy, joyous, and free. That was me. <laughs> when, it, when the book talks about you're going to know a new happiness, I know what they mean. It's not the old happiness that I had in happy hours. The new happiness is the joy of living here in Alcoholics Anonymous with a program that I can depend upon every moment of my life. This program works in all of our affairs. Um, but in those days, I thought happy was uh, being drunk and oblivious. And so uh, we were at war, and I thought, well, I, the ladies began to go to war. And I thought, well, I guess that's my explanation. I've got to get out of this drinking atmosphere, and I will join one of the services. And if you'll remember, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed, and I didn't like that uniform. Now, I'm as patriotic as anybody, but i got to have a uniform that looks good. <laughs> and so I, I looked them all over, and I decided upon, I, I really liked the Marine Corps. I was going to be a lady Marine. And the reason I was going to be a lady Marine is because they wore a red ascot tie. Now, isn't that patriotic for you? <laughs> They had a red ascot tie and a red silk cord around their caps, and I said, I'm going to be a lady Marine. And the next time I couldn't make it to work, and I, I got on the bus and uh, went to Richmond, and I needed a drink very, very badly. And I didn't want to drink because I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to be macho. I wanted to be John Wayne. And, I, you know, I didn't want to breathe alcohol. I probably did already. But I said, no, I can't drink before I join the Marine Corps. And I'm shaking by the time I got there. And have you ever tried to sign your name when your hand is shaking and it won't go in the right direction? And sometimes it just flies off like that. <laughs> and so I'm concentrating on signing all these papers in order to become a Marine and um, holding on to everything. And, and, the, and the act we put on, I had to smile and look healthy, look like what I thought a Marine lady should look like. And inside, I'm dying. I need a drink. I'm scared. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. And I'm wishing I were anywhere else. And I signed all these papers. And then he shook my hand and swore me in. And he said, welcome to the United States Navy. <laughs> and I said to him, sir, I came here to join the Marine Corps. And he said, honey, you got up on the wrong floor. You're in the Navy now. <laughs> my Navy career was not too... We had one explosion on base. It was not my fault. <laughs> they made me a Supply Corps officer. And I was assigned to an ammunition depot as a supply corps officer. I told you it wasn't my fault. <laughs> and they assigned to me several warehouses where we stored stuff. 
and eight seamen to do the actual work, a jeep, which I loved, but what I loved even better was the forklift truck. Now, my seamen were supposed to use that forklift truck to load the stuff on the pallets and all that stuff, but on the martini lunch days, I was the one. I was the designated driver. <laughs> and my seamen would lay on the floor and roll with laughter. They just thought I was the funniest thing in their time. And I would get on that forklift. We wore very, very short skirts in World War II. You do know we're talking about World War II, don't you? <laughs> and that, those, the fork would go up and down, and the, I'd turn on two wheels up and down those warehouses, and I had a ball, and the seamen thought they were too. But one day... One day, I heard one of them, his name was Cece, and I didn't remember that for many years. And we called him Cece. And he was muttering to his fellow friends, and I wasn't, I think I was supposed to hear him, but I did hear him. And he was saying, what's the matter with you? We don't like you anymore. You talk like us. Where did you learn that kind of language? We don't think you're such a hot person. You used to be nice. We used to like you. And this went on for quite a while. And I pretended, as I was to pretend now for a long, long time, that I did not hear him or that I did not hear you and I did not hear people. But I heard you. I heard people saying, she drinks too much. You've had too much. I began to get those envelopes in the mail, and when I'd open them up, there were little things about Alcoholics Anonymous. I threw them away, but I was beginning to, it was beginning to show. And that's what frightened me, because I already knew that something terrible was going on inside of me. This little girl that their parents, my parents wanted me to be a little lady with the white gloves and the black patent leather shoes and to curtsy and be a polite little girl, had turned into a drunk. And now other people knew it. And I thought I was the only one who knew I was fortunate I got out of the Navy okay, and a lot of my friends had uh, gone overseas. So I went over to the Pentagon building one day and signed up for a tour of duty in North Africa. And in 1942, that was just the right place for a drunk woman, I'll tell you. <laughs> Anything went, I'll tell you. I went to Algiers. That was shortly after Charles Boyer made a movie with Hedy Lamarr. And I got to Algiers, and that's where I met my Arab. My Arab wasn't just any ordinary fellow on the street. He was a chieftain. He um, had a title. He was called a Kaid. Now, the Kaid is like a mayor of Daytona Beach or Ocala or Dunedin. And my Kaid was a, of a, an oasis called Busada which was perhaps 50, 60 miles outside of the big city of Algiers. This was immediately after World War II. And I met my Kaid, and we went out to his busada where he was the Kaid, and we rode our camels into the sunset. <laughs> and we went out into some oasis a little farther out, and in, I really know some of this. Some of this has really truly happened, and some of it is fantasy, and I no longer know which is which. <laughs> but it's wonderful. It's like a movie, and it plays in my mind. And, it, you know, there was a tent with oriental rugs on the floor. You've seen them on television, and you've seen my Arab with his trailing uh, white robes and that thing around his head. And he wore a, a wrap called a burnous. Now, Bernouse is a cape like a fair with a hood on it. And as we rode these camels, and that, of course, the State Department frowned on all this. And they sent for me. And so we had to go back into Busada, and here's my Arab. And, and I wish I could remember his name. And I really liked that Bernus, and that we traded. He liked my navy raincoat, and I'm sure his—he may be wearing it still. I don't know. 
And my Bernoulli's got lost eventually, but I, when the State Department finally got me back into Algiers and they put me on board a ship and sent me home, but I wore my Bernoulli's as an evening wrap. And I wrapped myself in this thing, a cape, you know, up here, you know, and I'm peering. I stood in corners. I lurked in corners. <laughs> I thought I was a spy. <laughs> it was very weird. And I looked at this thing one day in a moment of some kind of truth, and it wasn't even beautiful. It wasn't white silk. It was made of brown wool. It was full of moth holes. It was gritty with sand, and it had been wrapped around too many goats, too many sheep. And, oh, it was it was filthy. It stunk. It stunk. Now, I never went to jail. I should have many times. I was taken to jail in a paddy wagon, uh, and it was the most humiliating thing that really ever happened to me. Really, uh, of all the things that I got into and out of and with people, that ride in the paddy wagon, that solitary ride in that dark, dark thing. And, and I'd been picked up in Arlington, Virginia, and um, I was all alone, and it was dark. And they took me to jail. And I don't remember much of it, and I don't remember making the phone call. In a complete blackout, I called the right person who came and got me and took me home and he put his arms around me and he said promise me you'll never drink like that again and I promised him that I would never drink like that again and I promised my parents I would never drink like that again I promised everybody I, I, I meant it I didn't want to drink like that but I didn't know any other way to drink I had been alcoholic since the first drink, and it was the only way I knew how to drink. But I didn't want to. And the book says sometimes we tell the truth and we don't know why. And I told the truth. I said, my, my parents would say, why do you drink like that? And I cursed them. And I, these marvelous people who had been so good to me and loved me so much, and I would try to hurt them physically, and I would curse them and use all that terrible foul language that... I knew, and I don't have to use any more, and you don't either. It doesn't do any good. You know, it doesn't do any good. But I would curse these marvelous people and tell them what I thought of them, and I was inside saying, oh, please, I love you, I will love you, but I don't know what's wrong with me, but I think I'm going crazy, and I was. And, and I began to go to hospitals. And I ended up in 1955... In Jacksonville, Florida. And I uh, made a phone call to Miami. And my cousin down there called the San Marco Clubhouse in Jacksonville and said, please go help my cousin. She's in a hotel something. It's not there anymore. And they said, does she want to get sober? And Pauline said, I don't know, but she sure needs to. <laughs> and two ladies came. And they sat by my bed, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about 12-step calls that we used to do. They came and sat by my bed, and I lay there in a drunken stupor, and one of them said, My name is Pat, and I'm an alcoholic. And all I could do was stare at her. She was as beautiful as any of you ladies sitting here today. Her nails were polished. Her hair was shining her lipstick was on her lips. <laughs> she had on a white dress that was completely white. And she said she was an alcoholic. And her friend said, my name is Dina, and I'm an alcoholic. And she was just as pretty and clean, and they smelled good. They had had baths that day. I'll never forget it. I wanted what they had, but the book says if you may have if you have decided you want what we have, and I hadn't made any decisions yet, but I wanted what those two ladies had. And they saw how sick I was, and they saw that I was hospitalized in Jacksonville at a place called Grant Haven. I don't think it's still there, is it, Jim? It was up on the Trout River. 
And it was an – it probably was an old fire trap because I remember being up on the third floor and there was only one flight of steps about this wide. And – but that's where they dried me out. And they began to take me to a couple of AA meetings at the San Marco Clubhouse. And I came back from a meeting and that night I had hysterics. I started to laugh and then I'd cry and I, I was hysterical all night long. And the next morning, the doctor said, I'm not going to let you go to those AA meetings anymore. If they're going to react like this, what's the matter? And I kept right on crying. I said, they liked me. They said they loved me. They said I should come back. And they put their arms around me. You know, nobody had put their arms around me in years, except the drunks that I palled with, you know, the drunks I drank with. I'm talking about gentle love. I learned what love is when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd been married once. I'd been in and out of, you know, what we ladies get into. And I found out that, I found out that love is different from lust. And I found that waking up in bed with someone you know and love is different from looking saying, who's that? And I went to the Duval County Hospital, and there I was up in the top with a, a day room and had to be in a certain place at night, and it was locked up. It was all locked up up there. And then they said, we're going to send you up to another hospital, and they drove me. Two AA members drove me all the way from Jacksonville up to Salisbury, North Carolina, to a brand-new veterans' hospital. And they locked me up again. And I spent Christmas there. For the first week I was there, I was in, I didn't know it, but I was in Ward D, A, B, C, D, which is the violent ward. And that week, I will never forget, and I'm very grateful for that week, because I saw ladies go into absolute insanity. These were mostly nurses. We were veterans of World War II, but many of these were nurses and people who had been near the active duty. I had never seen that active duty. I was always on state side. And they would be locked up in the rubber rooms. They would go in for shock treatment and come out like zombies. You'd be sitting and playing with three of your friends, and all of a sudden somebody tipped the table over. The cards would go all this way. You never knew what was going to happen in the violent ward. You'd be sitting reading the Sunday paper with a friend, and I'd say, may I have, oh, and the whole thing would go to pieces. Some of those ladies are still there. They're still there. I spoke up there about two years ago, and the doctor handed me his card. He's the new doctor in charge, and he said, some of those ladies are still there. I said, yes, I can see their faces, and I know that if I ever take another drink, I could be back with them. That week in the violent ward was a marvelous week for me, a marvelous experience. And after they, thought, they had it on record that I was suicidal. Well, I had tried suicide, but I never meant to finish the job. (laughs) All I wanted to do was wait for you to say, don't go, we love you, and then I'd be ready to go again. That's all I wanted was attention. But I went to the Ward A, which was the top grade war, and I could, actually I was given ground privileges, and um, I went to OT. I made the leather belts. I made good ashtrays, good ones. I I got a prize for one of mine. When you get a prize in the booby hats, that means something, I'll tell you. (laughs) HT, hydrotherapy, all that. There have been times in my 38 years of sobriety that I really would like to be back in hydrotherapy. You just lay in a tub and let it all wash away. You know, it's just great. But over Christmas, we, uh, we did the Christmas play. And I have since found out that many of our AA friends who have been in these places have participated in the mental ward Christmas pageants. (laughs) Clancy tells me he was the director of his. (laughs) I was King Herod. You can't get much better than that. I had a lovely red robe and a crown, the whole, you know, everything. And um, we had the whole cast... Christmas play. And the big thing was that Christmas Eve, three of our shepherds escaped. (laughs) 
There hasn't been a Christmas go by that I don't think about the citizens of Salisbury, North Carolina, waiting for Santa Claus and seeing three shepherds run down the street. They took us out in buses. Um, They were like school buses, if I remember it correctly. And um, from the men's ward and our ward, we would line up like school kids, two by two, and we would get on these buses, and they would take us around to see the Christmas lights. This was our big treat. And um, I remember pressing my nose up against the window, and, you know, it was cold, and your breath goes on that windowsill, and, it's, and I would make my initials and draw hearts like we do when we're kids, and not such little kids either. And, uh, but I was fantasizing and admiring all these lights for Christmas, and I thought, this is the way I'm going to live the rest of my life. I'm going to be 39 years old in a few weeks. This was December of 1955, and I was going to be 39 in January. And uh, I said, my life is over, and I will spend the rest of my days riding in someone else's bus, enjoying other people's Christmases and holidays vicariously. I will never have a life of my own. I will be in somebody's institution the rest of my life because my parents had finally done the best thing in the world for me they told me they were through they stopped enabling me my first husband divorced me they were through I knew there was nothing left and the rest of my days would be there in some institution And on January the 9th, they said, you're going to leave us. I said, where am I going? Well, where do you want to go? Just somewhere where you won't drink like that anymore. And so I left on January the 9th, and I was scared to death, and I drank like that. That's the only way I knew to drink. But something happened. Something wonderful happened. During that month, and particularly in December, I was there for four and a half months between Duval County and um, uh, the, the Grant Haven, and uh, uh, it was four and a half months by the time of January the 9th came along. I had heard enough about AA to know it was where I had to go, and I was going to go there when and if, and if I lived that long. And while I was in that hospital, I took what it says in Chapter 6, and it calls it a solitary self-appraisal. And the book says it is usually insufficient. But it was sufficient enough to get me to you. I took that solitary self-appraisal as a prelude to the fourth step of taking a moral inventory. But it was insufficient in that I had to pick up a drink on January the 9th. I got off the train, and I do not remember buying the bottle. The next thing I know, I, I must have been in a blackout. Hadn't had a drink in four and a half months, and yet in a blackout, not remembering a thing, I found myself in the ladies' room of the train station with a bottle. Don't remember anything in between. Did not have a drink for four and a half months. Blackout, right there. Alcoholic mind. And I'm taking the first drink out of the bottle, and I never was a bottle drinker. I always had to have a glass. Could be a dirty old cheese glass, and I'm under the table, but I did never drink. It was not ladylike to drink out of a bottle. <laughs> now, even today, I have a hard time with these young folks drinking their beautiful new water out of these bottles. You know, it just, it, I was taught differently. You had to put the milk in a glass, you had to put this in a glass, and then you drank it out of the glass. I have a hard time with that. Um, but anyway, I, I I'm picked up this bottle, and I'm looking in the mirror. And I saw myself change. As the alcohol went into my system, I felt my body relax. All the tenseness went away. I had my booze. I had my medicine. And I accepted the fact that that bottle was bigger than I was. I said, my God, I can't handle this. That's bigger than I. It got bigger. It's like Alice in Wonderland. The bottle got bigger and I shrunk. And I knew. I accepted it. And I came to believe that there was a power called Alcoholics Anonymous that could help me back to real life, to restore me to sanity. 
And I made a decision that I would turn my life over to those people like Dina and Pat and all those wonderful people I had met at the San Marco Clubhouse and the people that had come to see me. And I wanted to go to those people and say, tell me how you live without alcohol. And I made that decision right then and there, but the bottle was going down my gullet. I was drinking it, and my mind was comfortable. My shoulders were relaxed, and I said, oh, maybe tomorrow, tomorrow. Well, tomorrow didn't come until Saturday morning, January the 14th, and it was my 39th birthday. The night of Friday the 13th, I was on the train. I'd been drinking all the way down, trying to drink socially, really tried to drink socially. Now, not too long ago, I was on my way up to... uh, North Carolina someplace, and a lady kitty-cornered from me was, had ordered a drink. And they brought her those little, that little bottle like this, you know, $3 for that. <laughs> and she had a companion here. And the, she poured the 7-Up uh, or something in this glass, and then she started to take the top off this little teensy tiny bottle, and she's unscrewing it, and her companion spoke to her, and she stopped what she was doing. And she said, yes, and she talks with her booze over here. So pretty soon she comes back, and she completes the deal and gets it off, and then she holds the thing up to the light, and she measured, by golly, this empty, and she poured, that was enough. She only poured half of it in. And then she said, well, maybe a drop, drop more. And then she put this down. And then he spoke to her again. And he, she talked to him. And then she put the cap back and she put it in her purse. And then she picked up. And in the meantime, I'm saying, God damn it, drink it. <laughs> and she sipped. A little tiny sip, and then she talks again. That's called social drinking. It's a waste of booze. It really is. (laughs) Friday night, January the 13th, 1956. I was in a sleeping car coming into the city of Miami. And uh, I was crying and trying to drink out of the bottle. And the water fountain was, in those days, in the trains, they were tanks full of warm water with disinfectant in them. And it was terrible stuff. And they give, you had to reach up here and pull out a cup that was flat. And you had to open, if Patsy, you're, you're right with me, you had to open up this flat cup and get some of that stinking warm water and get the top off of a bottle. And you had to have six hands and teeth and everything else, and you're crying, and you need the drink, and you're shaking. And that's the way I was drinking Friday night, the 13th. And the next morning, about 6 o'clock, we pulled into the FEC station in Miami, Florida, and it was my birthday. And I said, please, God, no more. I had the drink in my hand. I had more in the bottle. It was there was more to, there available to me. And I'd prayed before, and I'd always bargained, and I'd always said, "I will do this if you'll do that." But this morning, it was just a very sincere, and I don't know if it was out loud or what it was, but I know what I said. I said, "Please, God, no more." And I put the drink down, and I've never had to pick up another one. It was that simple. It was that simple. There's nothing big about it except I was to realize many years later, I didn't know it at the time, but the book says one of the definitions of a spiritual experience is when we are able to do something with God's help that we could not do unaided. And that morning on my 39th birthday, with God's help, I was able to put down that last drink, a spiritual experience doesn't have to be a hot flash. I didn't even recognize it as such. And as I look back over my life of sobriety now, I've seen a lot of little things that I know now were spiritual experiences, spiritual awakenings, the slow kind that the book talks about in the appendices. 
my life has been a series of spiritual awakenings. I looked up my birth certificate sometime later, and I was born on January the 14th, 1900, and, huh? <laughs> at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was reborn at the same time of my natural birthday. And the book says we were reborn. And I had the marvelous opportunity to be reborn on my normal birthday. So if you ask me how old I am, I will tell you today that I am 38. I don't know when I've seen a panel of speakers that are all over 70, three of us, and Sandy's not too far behind us. <laughs> um, my sobriety, very quickly, I became active in my group almost immediately. They handed me a list of 16 names and telephone numbers. Um, I said, what's this? They said, you're, you're, you're the speaker chairman, your program chairman. I said, so what do you mean? They said, you call these people and you make arrangements to exchange meetings. Well, remember, in 1956 in Miami, we had 16 groups, didn't we, Eddie? And uh, that, we knew everybody. And uh, by the time I got through with my program chairman job in six, seven months, I knew everybody in Miami, and they knew me. It was wonderful. And then I said, uh, I've got to get a job. And they said, no, not yet. I said, well, I have to. Uh, find an apartment. I was living with my cousin. They said, no, not yet. And I said, hey, look at that cute fellow over there. <laughs> and they said, no, not yet. <laughs> I married him. <laughs> well, he didn't stay sober. I did. My husband was one of those people that could tell everybody how to do it. He could tell you with everything on the book. He could talk the talk, but he could not walk the walk. And he died of alcoholism 16 years later. He never had more than one year of sobriety at any one time. But in between, he could carry the message, I'll tell you. He was a sweetheart. He was a southern gentleman from Jacksonville, Florida. And um, so I have a soft spot for Jacksonville. Um, after I was chair, program chairman, they handed me a little envelope one day, and they rattled, and I said, what's this? They said, you're our new treasure. I counted the money. It was like $4.98. You could have given me 4000 I couldn't have been more honored. You trusted me. And I began to understand what a trusted servant is. And you began to trust me to do jobs like the intergroup representative. I was about a year sober when they said I had to go to those meetings for six months. And I went every month for six months and never heard or learned a thing. Never understood what they were talking about. But what I learned was, and a very important word that came up this morning, someone mentioned it about Liz, you learn dignity, you learn punctuality, you learn to be conscientious, you learn that you've got a job and they trust you to do it. And you learn all these things by doing things in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're called upon to do something, you say yes, and then you do it. And you do it to the best of your ability. And many years later, after uh, you honored me by becoming your floor, a delegate from South Florida, and when I came back from being delegate, I said, what's left for me to do? And someone said, well, they got an intergroup thing coming up. I said, yeah, they need a new chairman. So I became chairman of intergroup 20-some years later. And finally, I found out what they do in intergroup. <laughs> And that's, I, I knew all along because I was the one who called Intergroup in the first place and said, they, they said, come and um, uh, go to a meeting. And they told me where it was. My first phone call was to Intergroup. Um, my life of um, sobriety has had, uh, my parents came down to live in Miami. And I thought I was doing my best to make amends to them. At the same time, my husband was in and out of jails, stockades, hospitals, drunk tanks, and uh, constantly he, he also had what the book calls grave emotional problems, and he was incapable of being honest. And when we old fogies tell you young people to not make major decisions for a year or so, we're telling you that from experience. I married my Bob when I was five months sober. I thought he had 16 years of sobriety because that's what he told me, but I did not check him out. 
But believe us when we say, find out who your relationships are with. Find out something about these people. I didn't know he had was only sober about two months when I met him. I didn't know he had grave emotional and very deep emotional problems. Uh, and they were very serious. And uh, these, uh, there were policemen involved and police women involved. And uh, I, I went through a terrible time. My seventh year of sobriety was hell. But I'll tell you what it did for me. It got me into this book, the chapter to the wives. I went to Al-Anon. And those marvelous Al-Anon people, they, they told me to detach with love. And I couldn't understand that. I didn't like that word detach. And one day I was over in New Orleans for a convention and a marvelous lady named Elsa was speaking, Elsa C. And Elsa told her story of her alcoholic and she described my alcoholic as she talked about her alcoholic named Chuck. And she says, her alcoholic was so wonderful. He was handsome. He was charming. He was intelligent. And... Everything she said about her alcoholic fit me and my alcoholic. And then she said she had to learn to release him with love. Like a little bird in the hand. She says, just let him go. Release. And I could understand that. I couldn't understand detached, but I could understand that. And I had to release my Bob. And then he died of alcoholism. And it's not a pleasant death. We share experience, strength, and hope. So if you're new, and, and last night we asked for hands, and there were a lot of hands went up with those under a year. Are there any here today with less than a year of sobriety? Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. I drink to you. I wish you well. I think that Alcoholics Anonymous is really quite a lot like sex. (laughs) If you're not enjoying it, you're not doing it right. (laughs) Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.